So, Kent, there's a lot of talk that Social Security just won't be there for younger people. Right. So my question is, will millennials receive the same Social Security benefits as their parents? Under current law, the answer is no. In fact, we're projecting that the trust fund will be exhausted by 2031, just 14 years. So what the law actually says is that benefits across the board have to be cut um, in order to simply match the current payroll tax revenue that they're getting at the time. So that's about a 30% reduction. And more so that means uh, uh, 2034 or so? In 2031. 31. Yeah. If nothing changes, then Social Security uh, benefits, payments, monthly payments, would have to be cut by 30% for everyone? And that's the key. It's not just for new retirees, which could be a little less painful, but your 90-year-old grandmother who's maybe just surviving on Social Security, the benefits would be cut for her as well. Okay. So, um, so of course, everyone's scrambling to figure out what are some things that can be done about this. Uh, one of the uh, common ideas is to raise the retirement age for Social Security. How much does that help? It doesn't help much for the short term. In particular, it barely moves the trust fund exhaustion date um, from 2031. It, um, and the reason why is that under current law, Social Security retirement age is creeping up to age 67. Even if you push it out to age 70, it, this idea that's been batted around for a couple decades in Washington, we just kind of waited too long to do it. Um, and so it barely moves the trust fund exhaustion date. Over the long term, it actually has a, a, a much bigger impact. But for the immediate term on the Social Security Trust Fund, it barely moves it simply because we waited too long mm -hmm. to do it. And what's the difference between the immediate and the long term? In other words, at some point we'd be better off if, if not fully whole. But how long w would the lag time be? So uh, it, it, the trust fund exhausts in 2031. Um, because of this, we would phase in toward age 70 along the current path, which is about two months per year. It takes too long. So um, the trust fund barely moves um, over what's called a 75-year window, which is how Social Security actuaries typically look at this. It helps by uh, improve the uh, finances by almost a third. So it actually has a big impact over time. It's just that it takes a long time for it to phase in. Oh, okay. And the other solution often put forth is, well, how about if we uh, increase taxes on people with high incomes because there's a cap right now on, who, on how much people pay? That's right. In particular, you pay taxes up to the first $118,500. That's indexed with wages, so it, it kind of grows over time. And we call that the tax max. And it's the maximum that your, your uh, income that your taxes are, are, are levied over. And so if you increase that from 118,500 to all the way to 400,000, for example, um, it, it basically moves the trust fund exhaustion date from 2031 to 2036. And going above 400,000 has almost no impact because there's just not enough people there. In fact, going from 250,000 to 400,000 has very little impact. So again, it can be part of, of a bigger solution, but by itself, it's not gonna solve the problem. What about um, reducing benefits for high-income people who presumably don't need the money as much as that 90-year-old that grandmother does? Right. And that's a, another idea that's been um, discussed in Washington. A lot of people don't understand that, that the benefit formula is actually extremely progressive. For poor people, we replace 90 percent of their average income before retirement. And then, then that decreases quite a bit um, f for middle income and then higher income uh, households. And so the idea has been let's keep poor people kind of whole 90 percent replacement rate, but lower it for middle class and kind of upper income households. Yeah, even the uh, very um, aggressive uh, across the board uh, a change um, is for the trust fund by itself, it's, it's basically too late. I mean, it barely moves the trust fund. As far as the seven-year, five-year solvency, it again has a much bigger impact. In fact, if you combine that with increase in the retirement age, we actually solve the 75-year problem. Um, with those two combinations. However, it, it, we still would have to come up with a mechanism 
for the trust fund to somehow borrow against its future, um, to essentially be able to not just hold assets but be be a, 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 in debt for a while. And how many years would that have to cover? It was uh, so that covers seventy five years, which is uh, the standard projection okay. window. Right, but you're saying there's, there'd be this interim when yeah. there would be a shortfall. There would be a shortfall for, depending on exactly the policy combinations, right. it, it could be between 10 and 25 years. Okay, so it might, might involve some borrowing before things kind That's of bounced right. off a little bit. Uh, the other item is the cost of living uh, allowance or raise of the COLA right. that is provided each year, although there wasn't one last year, right. um, based on inflation. Yeah. Uh, and if that were adjusted, how much would that help? Of course, in a way, that's cutting benefits if you cut that. Yeah, it, it is. And so under current law, what happens is that the uh, Social Security benefits are adjusted every year for using what's called the CPIW, which was just what they happen to choose at the time. And one of the concerns that economists have had is that that index doesn't uh, uh, account for what's called substitution, um, where you you might have uh, a product price that goes up on you, and you substitute toward lower prices. And we're seeing this, with, for, for example, with the Affordable Care Act. As a lot of plans go more expensive, people substitute toward cheaper plans. And so a true measure of in inflation would allow for that substitution Substitution. It's called the chain-weighted index. That's been something that's been discussed a, a lot ever since the Boston Commission and other groups. Um, it actually turns out it doesn't have a, that big of an impact. Um, even though the long term, it, it has a positive impact on the trust fund, not that big. And another concern that sometimes people raise is that it's not even clear even the chain-weighted is actually the right measure for older people. In particular, older people have a lot of out-of-pocket medical expenses that is not representative of the average person in the economy that the, ch that the chain weighted cares about, or even the CPIW, the current law. So that that will be something that is a lot going to be a lot of discussion about. Sure. In terms of the numbers, it doesn't really have a big impact. Uh, if Americans together paid more taxes, yeah. uh, would that save Social Security as we know it. Sure. I mean, if you increase taxes or cut benefits, you right. know, you're mm -hmm. going to solve the problem. And so if we just, uh, right now, if we think about the tax side, right now we currently levy uh, a, t a payroll tax rate of about 12.4% for Social Security and also the disability program, and then an additional tax to cover Medicare. So if we increase that 12.4% to, say, 14.4%, um, and that's 2%. Uh, points, but as a percent, you know that's that's it's a, shared by the employer and the employee. It's shared by the uh, by both sides. Right now, truth be told, most economists believe that ultimately the employees bear the the, the brunt of even the employer side. Right. That the incidence gets shifted through competitive labor markets. Um, if we did that, if we went from twelve point four to fourteen point four, we would um, increase the life of the trust fund from about twenty thirty one under our projections to about twenty forty three. You would have to actually go all the way up to about sixteen point four percent to actually have the trust fund uh, be solvent until about twenty eighty five. Um, and even then, eventually, it's going to uh, it, it will go negative because benefits continue to rise. But if you if you took some of the other measures you were talking about earlier, yeah. and then also did this for the interim period them. to say get yeah. over the hump, yeah, sounds like that might work. Yes, yeah, there there. Are, our policy simulator allows for 4,096 combinations. And so <laughs> lots of different combinations that people can try and they get instant feedback on that. And it's from a very sophisticated model, but we've used advances of cloud computing to pre-calculate everything for you so you get instant feedback. So there's lots of combinations, even ones I haven't had time to explore yet that could potentially uh, work here. Well, we'll get to the model that you're talking about yeah. that you helped develop soon, or, or soon we'll get to it. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, that's going to be something that anyone can go on the web and use. Is that right? Everybody can use it. And, uh, policy uh, policymakers were hope um, we, we've had a lot of conversations with them. They're excited about. They want access to tools that they can use while they're actually writing legislation. But uh, the average person can use it, and um, we've been sh uh, showing it to various professors around the country, and they want to use it for their classroom, just to tr give students tools that they can start to see these. Trends. Off. So an interesting new tool. Yeah. So Kent, the yes. whole idea of immigration, 
I guess, illegal immigration, undocumented workers, has been a big part of this presidential primary right. process and now the presidential race. So uh, I guess the $64,000 question is, uh, will providing a path to, to legalization for unauthorized workers, immigrants, uh, in the U.S., will that improve the economy or does it hurt the economy by hurting uh, some lower wage workers. Yeah, it, it turns out, and this is one of the surprises that uh, we, we found, and this is re really one of the advantages of having this really detailed model, is that the impact on the economy from legalization is, is basically a wash. And it, here's what's go going on. When it comes to jobs, legalization actually slightly reduces the number of jobs and the uh, and what's, uh, number of people working. And the reason why is that when you're illegal, you pretty much have to be working because you're not, you don't have access to unemployment insurance, you don't have access to going to sc schooling like college and things like that. We probably came here to work to begin with. You came here to work and you pretty much have to work to eat. Uh, once we have legalization and we're able to track at the census level data the differences between uh, undocumented and, and legal, uh, and what we see is legal immigrants have a slow, uh, a little bit of a lower um, labor force attachment rate. And the reason why is because um, they can uh, uh, spend more time looking for appropriate work, they qualify for unemployment insurance, and they also can get a college degree and up their skills. And so that that's the reason why the effect on GDP is basically a wash. In particular, less um, employment, but more at more skills, and it's, uh, it has almost no impact. So the implication is that deporting uh, illegal immigrant workers isn't going to help the economy. Uh, yeah, in fact, uh, some people will, on the other side say, well, deportation should be good for the economy. That turns out not to be true either. Um, in fact, uh, we, we find, calculate that deportation actually will substantially lower GDP and lower jobs. And the intuition behind that is that native workers, native-born workers, their labor force participation rate cannot possibly increase enough to offset the loss of jobs. And so the impact on GDP is actually uh, fairly negative. Uh, another question is, can increasing the proportion of authorized immigrants yeah. uh, with college degrees, can that help our economy? So where a lot of kids come here, they get their degrees from other countries, and, um, and they, they're not able to stay. Right. And it's really critical, as you just noted, to, to, to distinguish between these are legal immigrants as opposed to illegal immigrants. We have about 800,000 legal immigrants per year. About 35% of them have a college degree. So a lot of the proposals have been, let's keep the 800,000 the, the same number, but shift that 35% upward, maybe make it half, 55% and so forth. To our surprise, and then this the value of having these detailed models, it actually has a positive impact by increasing the amount of college educated uh, immigrants. It has a positive impact, but it's not that big. And um, and the, as you dig into the numbers, what, uh, what you see is that first, immigration itself, as a legal immigration as a total, is only about 1% of the U.S. population. And, th and then when you go from 35% to 55%, you're actually increasing the college-educated workforce in the United States by only about half of 1%. So the impact, again, is positive, but it's not a huge impact. Instead, what you ultimately need to do is increase not just the, sh uh, the kind of the shift. You don't just, just change in the composition, but actually increase in the, in the, num the, 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 the number of H-1Bs without... Uh, in, uh, a change in the number of unskilled uh, I immigrants, that, that actually has a much bigger impact. What about lifting the total number? Of immigrants. Yeah. And so... Uh, or above 800,000. Yeah. Um, so increasing more immigrants basically m means more jobs and more uh, uh, GDP. Um, in fact, what we find that if we actually increase the legal immigration from 800,000 uh, by an additional 400,000, by roughly 50 percent, um, and by 2050, we'll have a GDP that's about 15 percent larger than what we see today. What is that annually? 
Do, do you happen to know? I'm just curious. Like, yeah. how much would GDP go up per year if you if you increase by that number? Well, it's a, a, over a trillion dollars. Okay. Um, and so it, we're we're talking about a pretty significant. Uh, and, and so in current dollars, um, I would have to do the <laughs> exact okay. calculation, but your, it's well over a trillion dollars. That, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, what a, what effect would an increase? Uh, in immigration have on Social Security and, say, Medicare. Yeah. Um, and that it used to be a very controversial issue. There was this, always this concern that immigrants are coming in right before they qualify for Social Security and, and Medicare. And that a lot of that debate is uh, was not correct, and a lot of changes have been made in the laws in the meantime. Um, nowadays, uh, w- uh, increased immigration is actually a slight improvement for Social Security and Medicare. And the reason why is immigrants are coming in during their working years, typically younger, and as a result, the, 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 what's called the old age dependency ratio is improved. And p- in particular, we have more young people relative to old people people, and that helps improve uh, the, the finances. It's not, it's not huge, um, but nonetheless, it is positive. So we've talked about this model that you've helped to develop. Why don't we go take a look at how it works? Great. Hi, I'm Kent Smethers, a professor here at the Wharton School, and I'm going to give you a quick overview of the new Social Security Policy Simulator that's available at the Penn Wharton Budget Model group. And you can see from the uh, screen here is that you have a choice of various graphs that you can be looking at, things like trust fund reserves, non-interest surplus, which is the difference between uh, benefits paid and tax income received, uh, Social Security taxes, benefits, uh, interest income, lots of other varieties. And we also compare our results against those from the Social Security Administration and the Congressional Budget Office. And first off, uh, be- before we do even think about any policy changes, you can see that our model pr- projects that we will um, uh, 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 exhaust, the trust fund exhaustion date will be about three and a half to four years earlier than the Social Security um, trustees uh, project. In particular, we uh, uh, see a, a, a deficits happening around 2031. And uh, it, w- come 2031, we're, we're seeing um, projecting that we'll actually have a non-interest surplus of about three $350 billion in today's dollars, eventually growing to um, over $1.2 trillion per every single year, again, in today's uh, uh, dollars. And our 75-year shortfall is about a third larger than what you see from the Social Security Administration. And, and to understand why, you can look at the uh, Social Security tax revenue, and we have a more pessimistic projection of tax revenue coming in over time. And the, the reason uh, behind that is that um, our, our model starts with census-level data, and we construct these uh, transition rules based on various big data sets across many different key attributes, age, Age, uh, race, marriage, divorce, number of kids, education, and many other attributes across a lot of population subgroups. So we're really working kind of bottom up. And as a result of that, we can see how productivity in the economy is changing as you have these large labor force um, composition changes as people uh, are going into retirement. Um, they're being replaced by younger people, and the uh, average productivity per worker, for example, goes down. As a result of that, our Benefits also go down um, a little bit relative to Social Security, um, but their um, our, our tax revenue is is uh, is the main uh, difference. And our numbers line up a little bit closer to uh, the CBO's own model on this. All right, so now let's consider some uh, different policy changes, and we have six options to pick from here. Um, increasing the payroll tax, uh, uh, increasing the taxable maximum, and lots of other options. There's uh, all the Together, there's uh, six options. Each has uh, uh, four different combinations associated with it. So there's actually four to the six power different combinations, 4,096 policy combinations that you can run. Now, our model, you know, it, it, 
Each one takes about 30 minutes to an hour to run. So you might be wondering how you're getting instant feedback as, as, as you move things around and different policy changes. And we, the reason is we're using cloud computing to do all the computations ahead of time. And so that gives you um, instant feedback. Let's consider a couple of policy changes that uh, uh, policymakers for years have been uh, kind of talking about. Let's, for example, talk about raising the normal retirement age, this one down here. And we have a little tool tip here where it basically says um, uh, what the current law is. Uh, in particular, the retirement age is going up to age 67, uh, roughly about two months per year. And if you want more info, it can give you even more expanded info information. And so this would be a policy change to continue that increase if you wanted to do that, say, even to age 70. And now when we do that, you'll notice here that the um, impact on the trust fund exhaustion date from increasing the retirement age is basically less than one year. It's, it's, it's a very small um, uh, change. And by the way, if you wanted to, you could even kind of zoom in on a particular years and kind of get, get more information. You can, you can actually uh, uh, look at particular years, the values, and so forth. And it doesn't have a big impact. However, um, over time, uh, increasing the retirement age does does have a much bigger impact on the non-interest surplus. Um, the, the big deficit uh, over time goes down. Um, and, and what's going on here is essentially that increasing the retirement age is, uh, is simply basically too late to solve the problem, at least for the trust fund. It can be part of a longer term solution, um, but it just simply phases in uh, too slowly over uh, a time. And then we have some other uh, uh, things that you can consider here. One is a progressive benefit reduction. Um, and uh, here it, it explains, the tooltip explains how benefits are currently calculated. In particular, the government um, you, uh, uh, currently uh, uh, calculates your benefits uh, uh, e equal to 90% replacement rate up to a certain value called a, a bend point, then 32% and then 15%. Um, and so this is a policy where you, you keep the 90% replacement rate for poorer households constant, but you decrease the replacement rate on richer households. And you can see the impact on the trust fund is actually also uh, a fairly small. Um, and the current policies are blue line, the red policy is kind of the new line, and it, it barely kind of moves uh, the trust fund uh, exhausting date. And and the intuition behind that is, again, um, it just is a bit too late to have an impact on, on things that phases in too slowly. However, again, over time, it has a much bigger impact. And then you can start to do interactions like, you know, suppose I want to do a, a progressive benefit reduction, increase the normal retirement age. And you can now start to see that it has a much bigger impact over time. In terms of the trust fund reserves themselves, again, not a huge um, um, impact, at least in the, the short run. Okay, so now let's consider, you know, other things. I mean, you can, um, a lot of people have argued for, like, increasing the taxable maximum. Right now, your uh, payroll is being taxed up to $118,000, um, $500 per year at, at a 12.4% tax rate. And so some people have argued that maybe we should levy that tax over our larger um, income base. And what we can see is, for example, as we go to um, uh, uh, the, say, increase the $250,000, it actually has a, an impact on, on the trust fund. As we go to 400000 it has a slightly bigger impact, not much of a difference um, going from two fifty to 400000 households. There's just not enough households there. And as you go above $400,000, uh, uh, it, it has almost no impact going forward. But again, um, uh, we get some life, but you know, over the long term, it, it starts to, you know, uh, get a little bit bigger. This is one of those policies that has a, a much bigger impact on the short run because it's immediately happening, than, um, uh, but the relative to the long term. And so you can now start to think about different combinations. I mean, there's a 4,096 combinations uh, here to, to, for you to explore. I, I haven't even explored the every single combination. And so you can um, see the trade-offs yourself, especially between the long run and the short run, by uh, giving you, uh, your own combinations a, a, a try. Thank you.
Now I'm going to give you a quick overview of the new immigration uh, reform policy simulator that's av available at the Penn Wharton Budget Model Group. Notice that you have uh, several different graphs that you can look at, things like total population size and uh, number of jobs, the old age dependency ratio that's very useful for things like understanding how many young people that we have uh, uh, per uh, older retiree, and then of course gross domestic product, GDP that people often care about. So now let's consider different policy combinations. Each one, uh, dial control here um, ha is, has five selections, and we have three com uh, policies all together. So that's 125 different policy combinations that you can um, uh, get and, and see uh, yourself. For each policy combination, you know, the, the actual simulation model takes several hours to run in the case of immigration, but we use advances in cloud computing to give you instant feedback on the results uh, because we've pre-computed everything for you. All right, let's go through the different policies. Um, let's think about increasing the net amount of legal immigration. Right now, from this tooltip, you can see that uh, net legal immigration to the United States currently amounts to about 800,000 people per year. And uh, some of the policy ideas out there is to maybe increase that, maybe 25% a year. And not so, so surprisingly, population goes up. Total number of jobs are going to go up, and um, GDP um, is also improved because of more um, workers in the economy. And the old age dependency ratio is slightly improved as well. In particular, we're going to have fewer older people per worker because immigrants are coming in uh, typically during working age. And we ha are able to track that uh, fairly precisely using census level data. All right, let's talk about some other um, uh, potential changes here. And the first one is, uh, or the second one, sorry, is, is, is changing now the composition of the net legal immigration. Right now, as you can see from this tooltip, about 35% of the U.S. adult legal immigrants have a bachelor's or advanced degree. So the idea here is that we can now increase that percentage without actually imp uh, changing the 800,000 uh, number of legal immigration, uh, immigrants per year year. And so we can look at a couple of things like, you know, uh, what happens to um, uh, GDP here. Uh, so suppose we go from 35% to 55%. And notice it's a slight positive. It's not huge. And it's true that this, that the values here are in trillions of dollars. But you can move your mouse over and see the, uh, the actual numbers. Or if you want to, you can always zoom in on a particular set of years and get even more precision there if, you, if you'd like. And in particular, the blue line is the current policy. The red line is the effects of the, the new policy. And the reason why it's, it's not a big impact um, is that uh, legal immig immigration flow at 800,000 per year um, is uh, uh, not that large of a fraction of the U.S. Uh, population workforce. And so going from 35 percent to 55 percent uh, uh, of being college educated is only going to add a around 160,000 college graduates per year, and that's only about one half of 1% of all college educated worker, workers in the economy. And so it doesn't have a tremendously large impact. All right, now let's look at a couple other policies. Um, and the one is to potentially increase deportation of a unauthorized immigrants. So now we're really shifting from legal status to unauthorized uh, immigrants. And the other one is to offer legal status, just the opposite um, to unauthorized immigrants. So we can see from the tooltip that there's about 11.3 million unauthorized immigrants in the United States. And so if you uh, choose to go, say, this direction of legalization, this is saying we're going to be legalizing uh, roughly around 10% per year. So within a decade, will have uh, legalized um, everyone. And so let's look at the impact on jobs. And this may be really so surprising to a lot of people. As we legalize, and notice um, jobs actually slightly go down. It's not a huge change, but it does, it's actually legalization actually leads to fewer um, uh, jobs. Again, not a big change, but it is technically negative. And the intuition there is that if you're currently unauthorized, you pretty much have to work and, um, in order to survive. And so unauthorized workers actually have a higher labor force attachment rate or participation rate than those that are authorized. 
authorized workers are able to now go to school and therefore not be in the workforce for a period. They're able to look for a better job, a, a more appropriate job, because they can qualify for unemployment insurance, things like that. And so that tends to reduce jobs. The impact on GDP is basically a wash. There's no particular theoretical reason this should be the case, but in terms of the, our rather detailed calculations, it's, it's basically a wash, and, and it has almost no impact on GDP. And the intuition there is that even though the number of jobs has gone down a little bit, um, the when, once you are converted to legal status, again, you're able to go to school, you're able to get more productivity, and so as a result of that, uh, the impact on GDP is, is uh, next to nothing. Now let's think about what happens when we go the opposite direction where we start deporting at say 10% per year within a decade everybody would be all, all the unauthorized uh, illegal immigrants would be deported now notice the impact on employment is now much more negative and the uh, the reason behind that is that we're losing um, people it's like a hundred percent detachment now for the workforce for unauthorized immigrants um, and the the, the native born um, participation rate in the labor market cannot possibly rise enough to um, uh, uh, meet that uh, that gap, that that reduction in the number of jobs. And GDP um, also goes down uh, uh, pretty substantially. You can see um, by uh, within by 2035. Um, close to a trillion dollars um, reduction in GDP. And so, you know, both these policies have been kind of advocated on both sides as saying that they're going to increase the, the number of jobs or increase GDP. In fact, <laughs> neither policy um, uh, uh, works in the way that it's, it's often been presented. And so you can try many other combinations yourself. Again, you have uh, about... Uh, uh, 125 different combinations to choose from, and again, many combinations I've even explored myself. So try the uh, try it yourself, and uh, make up your own mind. Thank you.